What we're now going to briefly discuss as well is the pesticide label, because a pesticide label contains a lot of information, much of it also addressing some of the issues we, we're addressing now, such as resistance management, etc. What we're going to do is we're going to use the label of this specific insecticide as an example of a pesticide label to discuss a pesticide label. The product is Addition 150 SC, which is an insecticide that is registered in South Africa and some other countries as well for the control of fall army work. So if you click on the icon in this uh, slide when, when you download the presentations, you will be able to access the uh, label file. And what one can do as a trainer is you can print out copies of these to give to the participants and the trainees so that they can follow uh, on, the, on, a, on, a, on a physical example of the label, the, the various aspects that we will be discussing. So this is what Edition 150 SC looks like. It's a plastic bottle, a one litre plastic bottle, which is a typical uh, container in which pesticides are sold. Most labels that you will um, encounter of pesticides in the market consist of what we call a front panel and then a side panel or side panels. And the appearance of this label can depend on the size of the pesticide container or bottle and various regulatory requirements in different countries. We saw the uh, one liter container earlier, but what must, one must also be aware of is that a lot of pesticides are available in small containers. So we have a, an example in the next few slides of a small 50 milliliter glass bottle of insecticide that is packed in a cardboard box. The bottle itself has the front panel on the panel label on it, and the box would also contain or does also contain a small measuring cylinder for measuring the correct dosage and a leaflet, which in this case is equivalent to what I've called the side panel. The outer box also has partial label information, parts of the front and the side panels printed on it. So this is what the product specifically looks like. So you can see there on the right hand side, the cardboard box on the left hand side, the little glass bottle containing the insecticide, the leaflet with the label on it, and above the box, a little measuring cylinder to be able to measure the right dosage. And if we open up the box, you can see there is um, not all the label information, but a lot of the label information is also included on the outer uh, cardboard box as well. This is another example of a very small packaging of insecticide. This one again has a cardboard box with a plastic bottle on the inside. You can see the uh, leaflet there that's inside the box with the label on it. This specific product has a small syringe within the box which is then used to, to measure out the correct dosage of the insecticide. And what you see on the extreme right of this picture is a pair of uh, very simple plastic gloves that the end user can use to protect their hands while working with this product. We have spent a lot of uh, time and uh, and so on in previous modules, specifically module one, talking about personal protective equipment. Uh, and one of the items which we discussed in some detail was the protection of hands, because your hands are often the part of the body that's most exposed to insecticides. When measuring the insecticide or mixing the insecticide or spraying the insecticide. And here you can see the company that has um, provided this specific packaging has actually included a pair of gloves. And as trainers and people involved in four armyworm um, projects in Africa, I would encourage you to lobby people such as agro dealers, manufacturers of agrochemicals and your regulatory authorities to make it a part of the legislation that companies include a pair of gloves with every pesticide sold. 
so that one doesn't have to worry about people uh, being exposed to pesticides while using them. Um, it, it, it's a reality that if, if somebody has to provide a pair of gloves with a, a pesticide before on them, it might cost a few cents more, but at least then we have the, um, you know, we know that people are going to be using the gloves and are probably not going to be exposed to the same extent as one year when they don't have access to a pair of gloves. Of course, uh, for farm use, agrochemicals are normally sold in bigger volumes. Uh, typically, the one litre bottle we've already seen. There are a lot of five litre containers sold and many agrochemicals are also sold in 20 or 25 litre plastic drums. Um, next slide, please. I want to show you another um, uh, container of a solid formulation. All the other ones that we've been seeing up to now have been um, liquid formulations, and we're now going to quickly look at a photograph of a solid formulation, in this case a water dispersible granule, and this is also in a one kilogram plastic container. Water dispersible granule formulations are like any liquid or mixed with water when one sprays it. And if you look at the photograph, you will also see the container is packaged with a measuring cup for weighing out the formulation to ensure the correct dosage. Next slide, please. And there is the example of that uh, solid formulation with the measuring cup on the right hand side. I also want to quickly uh, show a photograph of a product that's not a pesticide, but is what we call an adjuvant. This specific product is used as a mixture in the spray tank with other pesticide formulations. And again, it's packaged in a one liter plastic bottle. In many of the pesticides packaged in this way, and this includes the addition that we're going to be using in as, as an example, is that the side panels are found under the front panel as illustrated in the next two slides. And one accesses the information on the side panel by peeling back the front of the label, the front panel. There you can see the one litre container. And next slide, please. Here we can see the front panel peeled away and the all the other information regarding the product on the side panels under the front panel. And this is just to illustrate uh, a, a product in a 20 liter plastic container drum. And in this case, the entire label, front panel and side panel is on the outside of the container. So what is the basic label information that one has? Let's look at the front panel first. Most pesticide front panels will contain the following information. And one can point this out in the following slides to the trainees, and they can also follow it in the printed out uh, copy of the label that, that you give them. So it will have the brand name. So the brand name will be the, the, the name under which is the sold. So um, for example, Coca-Cola is a brand name. It will have the active ingredient, and if you know a little bit about Coca-Cola, you'll know that the active ingredients in Coca-Cola are sugar and caffeine. It will tell you what's the concentration of the active ingredient, what type of product it is. It has what we call a color band, which indicates the toxicity of the formulation, as well as various pictograms that illustrate the risk to the applicator and to animals and the environment. There are additional pictograms that will illustrate what sort of PPE needs to be used in mixing and spraying the actual product. There will be registration information and information on the company, as well as the formulation type. And important, when we look at the insecticide resistance management, there is normally information on the chemical group under which the product falls. Next slide, please. So there we have the front panel of an our example. If we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, in this slide, you can see the product is in an insecticide. And off the right top, you have a little logo. In this case, it looks a bit like an ant, which also gives additional information to the user 
and hopefully you'll be able to recognize from that that this is an insecticide. This slide illustrates the registration information for the product, and this will be, of course, different for different countries. Uh, this illustrates what type of formulation it is. And here we have an indication of what the actual active ingredient is. This is the group or the mode of action group of the specific active ingredient. Next slide. And this is the concentration of the active ingredient in the formulation. Next slide. Often a front panel will also have information regarding insecticide resistance management. And in this specific case of the addition product that we're using as an example, the insecticide group is group 22, which is a voltage dependent sodium channel blocker. And it's also indicated by the IREC group code or the number. So all pesticides will be, uh, all insecticides will be classified into a group by IREC. We've already mentioned the app that you can use, and there's a lot of information on their website re regarding insecticide resistance management. Um, there is where the information regarding IREC insecticide group and the number of the group is on the front panel. Next slide. And here we have information regarding the registration holder. Who is, who is it that is manufacturing and selling the product? On the front panel there is normally also what we call a color band, which indicates the toxicity of the formulation and has a number of pictograms on it telling the user how to use the product. This color band consists of a number of different elements. On the left hand side of the pictogram is always a pictogram, and you can see it in the bottom right hand side of the slide, that indicates that pesticides should always be kept locked up when not in use and should be kept away from children and people who do not know how to use pesticides correctly. In the middle of the color band is a warning pictogram and what we call a signal word. In this case, the signal word is harmful with the little cross above it. The World Health Organization classifies uh, pesticides for these color bands. And this is based on the acute toxicity of the specific formulation. So you have classes from 1A to 1B to 2, 3, and U, or in the past, which was sometimes called class 4. The hazard symbols associated with those are for the first two classes of skull and crossbones, which should indicate to most people that this is quite a toxic pesticide. Then we get the cross, like we saw on the, on the addition example. Uh, and then the, the last two classes don't have any symbol. But they also have what we call the signal word, and for one classes 1A and 1B, those are very toxic and toxic. For the addition example, the signal word is that it's harmful. And for the fourth class uh, in this uh, example, it's the signal word is caution. So one still, even although there's no symbol there, and one could assume that it's less harmful than the other pesticides to the left of it, one should also still be very careful when using it. And then the color band, the red normally uh, is ind indicative of danger. So the first two classes are red. Then we have a yellow class and a blue class. And this is how we classify pesticides and how we carry this information across to people using the label. Then there's a group of uh, pictograms that are normally included in this, in this color band. And first of all, we have what we call the mixing and loading activity. This is when the farmer or user will take the pesticide, measure the correct dosage, and mix it in the spray tank. It's shown in a se separate box, and uh, you read the activity from right to left, as the arrow indicates there. So what this is showing us is in the first pictogram, you are measuring the insecticide. And in this case, 
it shows a bottle with a liquid being poured into a measuring cup, similar to the one you saw in the pictures of the examples earlier. This is followed by two pictograms showing that you must wear gloves and you must wear a face mask while you are measuring and mixing and loading this pesticide into your spray tank. So for addition, uh, the addition product 150SC, this is what the mixing and loading activity box looks like. It says gloves, face mask and boots. So there's no excuse for a, a user of the product to not understand what uh, he needs to be careful about. He, we've discussed this in module one. There are possibilities that one can use things like plastic bags as gloves, etc., etc., to get uh, to make sure that one's not exposed. Once we've mixed and loaded the product, of course, into the spray tank, then we have to actually spray or apply the product, and this is again a separate box in the color band and here we read it from left to right as following the arrow so let's read this one and in the first one it says i'm going to spray the product and here it shows that someone who's spraying this specific product should be wearing gloves and boots these are the minimum uh, ppe that one should be using in spraying almost any pesticide this is the specific uh, activity box for spraying addition 150SC. So here it's telling us gloves, boots, and a face mask. There are additional pictograms, and to the right of the spraying activity box, there is always a pictogram that indicates that when you've finished spraying, you must always wash your hands and face to get rid of any potential insecticide uh, uh, contamination. Other pictograms, will also convey other meanings. So for example, this one would alert the user to the fact that this product is potentially harmful to domestic animals, illustrated here as, as a chicken and a cow. So this is the color band summary slide. Uh, it's basically a summary of everything I've discussed over the last couple of slides. I think it's also a good idea as a trainer to maybe print out this specific slide and give it as a handout to uh, trainees and farmers so that they can always refer back to it in terms of what they are actually seeing on the label. One can also use uh, these pictures as, a, as an exercise with trainees. Basically what one does is one asks the trainees to write down what the various pictograms mean. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And one can then have a discussion about what their answers were. Um, maybe some of them got something wrong. One can re-explain the issues to them and so on. So one can use these pictures as an example to uh, have an exercise with the trainees to make sure they actually understand what is going on with the pictograms. There might be other instructions on the front panel. Uh, one of them might be shake the bottle well before use. There are some types of formulations that will settle out if left standing on a shelf for a long time. And very important, before using this product, read the label carefully. One needs to be able to, to, to know what the label is telling you. A typical side panel of an insecticide label should always at a minimum contain the following information. Uh, the pre-harvest interval or withholding period, I will, do, I will briefly describe that a little bit later. Again, any resistance management warnings, any compatibility with other products. Many, many farmers would, would like to mix various products in the same tank and this information will tell them whether this is possible or not. Then the actual mixing instructions and then how to apply the product. Are there specific techniques one has to use, etc.? And then the label must, of course, uh, tell you about the dosage rates and the instructions for applying the product at various rates on various crops. A pre-harvest interval is also known as the withholding period, but this indicates the period in days that needs to pass between a insecticide application or any pesticide application and the harvest and use of the crop. In the example that we're using, addition 150SC, 
this period is seven days for maize. So if one sprays uh, the uh, addition on a Monday, one cannot pick the maize to eat it or use it in any way before next Monday. One would have to wait for seven days or one week for addition 150 SC. And then you can see we've highlighted the maize, but you will notice that products like this are registered on a number of different crops. And the withholding period for different day for different crops can be very different from one day up until 40 days, 42 days in this case. So one has to make sure that one looks at this information. Because many of the crop pests, and we've already discussed this with fall armyworm, have developed some sort of resistance to some insecticides, most of our labels will have a statement related to resistance management. This is a resistance management statement example from the label of Edition 150 SC. And you can see it warns about the repeated use of insecticides from the same group and how one should actually uh, go about rotating insecticides to um, prevent resistance development. General directions for use are always on the, found on the side panel as well. How to apply the product, what um, uh, climatic conditions can do to the product, what, what the effect of rainfall might be, and all sorts of additional information might be on this part of the label. Um, compatibility with other products, as I've mentioned, sometimes agrochemicals are mixed together. Normally one does this if you've got two types of pests and the one product only controls one of those pests. Then one would mix, for example, two insecticides, or if one has an insect, insect infestation as well as a disease at the same time on the crop, one might mix things like insecticides and fungus fungicides together so that one saves cost, so that one only applies once in, as opposed to two times. And most labels will state whether this is possible and how to do it. Just to come back to this issue of compatibility, and we've discussed um, adjuvants in um, module six, when we uh, use an insecticide spray for fall armyworm, the worm or the caterpillar is often hidden deep in the maize plant's wool they're all burrowing into the cob. Therefore, the use of an adjuvant, such as a super spreader, for example, as we illustrated in module six, can be used to ensure that the insecticide gets to where the worm is in the wool. And once again, one must make sure that the adjuvant, adjuvant one uses must be compatible with the insecticide. And this would normally also be stated on the label of the product. Here is, for example, a compatibility uh, statement for the addition label. And you will see it says addition 150 SC is compatible with a product called Judo. And then surfactants like breakthrough or charge, which is the specific one we discussed in module six. So in this case, one would be able to mix this product addition with the charge product that was discussed in uh, module six and apply them together to the maize plant. So what are the application rates? What is the dosage? And what's the other information we need from the, the label? The example from our label of addition will show the above information for the control of specifically fall army worm on maize. You must note that when, when we look at this, there will be a restriction on the use of the product during the season. And what it will say is you can only apply two times per maize growing season with this product addition. This is related to insecticide resistance management. And like I've said before, one should encourage rotation to a different insecticide every time one applies a product for fall armyworm. Here is the actual label information for fall armyworm on maize. And you can see there are some uh, additional information there as regards the amount of water one should be using and etc. One would must be aware of the fact that there can be different packaging types and different colors. Some manufacturers will have different, different packaging types, different colors, logos, caps, etc., to distinguish the different pesticides from one another. 
Here you can see an example of different packaging related to different product types. So from the top one would get insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, additional herbicides, adjuvants, etc. As a trainer, you should also be aware of the fact that different countries may have very different labeling requirements. So I'm going to show you an example of an insecticide label for Mozambique. And for Mozambique, there is a specific pictogram to indicate that this product is an insecticide. And the warning symbol is different to all other countries. And of course, the language for Mozambique is Portuguese. Illustrated here is an example of an insecticide for use in Mozambique. And in the red circles, one can see that the warning signals and the indication that it's an insecticide look very different to some of the pictograms and things I've been showing you in the addition example. And Mozambique and Angola being old Portuguese colonies have labels that look very different to most other countries. Again, we want to discuss labels in different countries. Um, the product called Belt 450 SC is a product that's used in, in, in Africa for the control of fall army room and in other parts of the world. And what I'm going to show you now is the front panel label of this product from Brazil, which is then also in the Portuguese language. Although the format of the label that I'm going to show you in the next slide looks slightly different from the addition 150SC we've been using in the example, essentially the same information is present on the front and side panels. And there you can see the label, the front panel label for the belt insecticide in Brazil. And here you can see the label information for fall army worm on control on maize in Brazil. And again, uh, the information will be very, very similar to what we've seen on the addition label. I'm going to show you another example of this exact same product, Belt 4 ATSC, for the Kenyan market. Again, although the appearance of the label is different to that of the Brazilian label, the information contained on the label is the same. And the Kenyan label is in English and Swahili. One of the things you as a trainer or facilitator can do is ask people to come and point out some of the label elements of the Kenyan belt label on the front panel on the next slide. And some of the things you can ask them to show are what type of product is it? What is the active ingredient? What is the formulation type, etc.? And here we have the front panel label for belt insecticide as it's found in Kenya. And here are the label directions for use in, in terms of the application rate, the dosage, etc. For fall armyworm on maize. It's the bottom one in that table. What is interesting about this is that there are some differences between this label and ones in other countries as well. So this is the actual directions for use for belt in Kenya. You have to apply between 150 and 200 milliliters of the product per hectare mixed in 400 liters of water. If you're going to be using a knapsack sprayer, this will be 7.5 to 10 milliliters of product in a 20 liter knapsack sprayer. And to come back to some of the other modules that we've been discussing during the development of this training material is, here is very uh, clear instructions about scouting the maize crop, where they state one should be scouting every seven days, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, there's a lot of information on most, most of these labels and one should make sure that trainees and farmers are reading the labels that they use. We've also discussed in module one that pesticides are sometimes sold without labels and that we don't want per people to purchase these or use them because the information we've been discussing now related to the label is absent on these products. And how would one know how to use the product correctly if that information is not there? 
never buy pesticides that have been decanted into other containers. And this is particularly important if the container looks like a soda bottle or other containers that might contain beverages because people might accidentally pick these up and, and drink some of the pesticide and in this way become uh, exposed to the insecticide. As a trainer, we need to make sure that what we've been telling people has uh, uh, been learned by them. So what we have in the next slide is another label. It's not the same as the addition one. It's a product called Linear 350 EC. And there is a file in the next slide that you can uh, double click and download and print out and give to groups of trainees or participants that you are speaking to about fall armyworm and get the groups to mark with a pen various aspects related to the label, such as the brand name, the registration number and information, the color band, the pictograms, the pre-harvest interval, the application rates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's nice to be able to sort of do this kind of thing in a competitive way as well. So you can, for example, say the group that lists, that, that indicates where these things are on the label first, correctly, of course, uh, might win a prize of some sort or, or whatever. Um, it's nice to get people to compete against one another because they, they seem to enjoy that and they seem to learn much better in that way. So there is the actual label that you can print out for this exercise. There's a lot of information on pesticide labeling and there are two um, uh, links here to information on pesticide labeling one from CropLife and one from the Food and Agriculture Organization that you can also download and use as a, as a training guide or as training material for your trainees and farmers. We've already discussed this issue actually about protecting your hands. And I said, did you notice that the small plaque illustrated in this presentation included a pair of gloves? While none of the larger packs, one liter, one kilogram, 20 liters, had gloves included. And whether you are a trainer, a farmer, a spray service provider, an official, a project manager, don't you think it is high time for you to lobby pesticide manufacturers, agro dealers, and regulatory authorities to include a pair of gloves with each container of pesticides sold? And again, we just want to emphasize that we do not want people buying these decanted, unlabeled products because all that information that we've now discussed is not available on products like this. So one has to now ask the question, what pesticide do we use for fall army room control? When it invaded in 2006, there were of course no pesticides registered or recommended for the control of fall army room because it was a new and invasive pest. So what happened is most of the initial use of pesticides was based on information from the experiences of South, Central and North America. Most African countries have some sort of regulatory uh, laws and regime for the registration or licensing of pesticides for sale and use in agriculture. These procedures are often very time consuming, expensive and so on. And this is rightly so, given the potential for pesticides to cause harm to humans, animals, food and the environment. And we've discussed some of these issues in terms of toxicity. What happened in the initial stages of the four army room invasion in Africa is that many of the countries with a regulatory system established what we call a emergency registration scheme to assist with uh, controlling fall armyworm. In addition, there were a lot of governments that purchased large quantities of pesticides, which were mostly given for free to subsistence and smallholder farmers. And this, there's obviously, there are obviously often political motivations behind these kind of actions by governments. And one wants to make sure that these pesticides that are being given away for free are also used correctly. So here we have a document from the Kenya Ministry of Agriculture and Immigration regarding the status of four army worm in, in Kenya. And from that document, you will see what are the recommended pesticide active ingredients 
in Kenya for the control of full army room. And you will see the different uh, pesticide classes as well as the active ingredients and then the trade names of these various products. So most countries will have lists like this. And in many countries, this list will be based at this stage still on emergency registrations to control the invasion. This is the list of uh, emergency registrations for fall armyworm for uh, control in South Africa. And I'm going to just use this uh, list as an example of the types of pesticide that are available in various countries. If you look down at the left hand column, you can see our product addition, which is we've been using as an example to discuss the label. And as you can see from the South African list, there are a lot of different products registered for fall army room. Uh, some more products and the next slide, please. And more products. Next slide. And there's the end of the list. Um, this is a big list, so it's a, it's a good list to use as, a, as an example of the variety of pesticides that might be available in various countries for fall army room control. So what we've tried to do is to take the pesticides listed in the South African example and rate them. And when I say rating, uh, I'm, I'm thinking here of um, things like uh, environmental impacts and toxicity and so on of the pesticides. One must remember one can rate pesticides in many different ways. For example, one can rate a pesticide as effective or not so effective. One can rate it as um, easy to use, not so easy to use. But what we've done here in this rating is basically look at uh, potential environmental effects and toxicity of the products in order to rate the products. And what we've done is we called them red, uh, uh, orange and green. So the green ones would be the ones that um, are probably less toxic and probably less environmentally unfriendly. And the red ones would be more. Uh, toxic and probably more environmentally damaging. So let's just go through the active ingredients from that South African list very quickly. And what we've done here is put them in their various chemical groups. I'm not going to discuss these in any way now, but you can see there's a, a vast variety of these products and, they, and the color of the text indicates where we see them in terms of our rating uh, traffic light example. And by having a list like this, one can uh, encourage farmers to choose pesticides from the group that um, is uh, most suitable in terms of, in this case, toxicity and environmental impact when they want to control fall army room. But like I said before, there are lots of various ways one can rate these things. So it doesn't mean to say one cannot use a product like illustrated here that is red in our traffic light system. And again, here's some more examples from that South African list and even more of them. Um, in some countries, and here again is an example from South Africa, these, the fall army worm has been um, uh, classified as a notifiable pest, which means it's invasive and people are almost forced by legislation to, to, to control the fall army worm in South Africa. And where these types of schemes exist in various countries, it helps to uh, bring attention to the pest, to uh, provide resources for farmers, etc. And what this means is that the one must, in fact, notify authorities if the, if the pest is present and make various uh, attempts to control the insect. And here you can see some of the compulsory notification uh, clauses within that classification of fall army worm as a notifiable pest. And the name of the product, of course. Next slide, uh, of the pest. Next slide, please. The European Union itself, uh, there is, 
at the moment, we don't know of any fall army worm that has invaded Europe, but the European Union has already established emergency measures to prevent the introduction of fall army worm within the Union. And these are some of the, uh, this is some of the documentation from the European Union's emergency procedures. So the question one has to ask then is, what pesticide do we want to use to control fall armyworm? What is the farmer's decision? And as in the case of making decisions about lots of different things, the final decision of the farmer will depend on a large number of factors. And the first one we have to think about is, is the product registered in the country? We do not want farmers using unregistered products, so one must make sure the product is registered. We've looked at the um, traffic light example where we have some products in red uh, that indicate their toxicity. So the farmer has to ask himself, what is the potential toxicity of the product and the risk to me? And if it's if I want to use a product in a in, that's a red group, for example, do I have the right and the correct personal protective equipment? Do I have my gloves and everything in place? One has he will also ask him, ask himself, do we have some some unacceptable environmental risks associated with a product? And then most important for most smallholders and most farmers in Africa, they will ask. What does the product cost? It doesn't help us saying you can only use green products if the green products are very expensive. The farmer is not going to use them in that case. Another question, of course, is what, how effective is the product? And I've already indicated there are products that are less effective and products that are more effective. And this is not necessarily to do with uh, resistance. It's just that intrinsically, some products are more effective on, um, on caterpillars, uh, like fall armyworm, and some are less effective. So one has to ask all these kind of, of questions. Um, and then if, if it's known, one must also ask the question, is there potentially resistance to this, to this product? And we already know that there's work being done on this in Africa. Some of the genes have been identified already. We know that there's resistance in some countries, etc. Which pesticide to use? The reality is that most farmers will be exposed to or will have available, whether it's at a agro dealer or wherever they get hold of their pesticides, that are of older chemistries and potentially more toxic chemistries and active ingredients. But what one has to be also aware of that some of these products whether they're red or whatever the color is that we've assigned to them, can be used with the appropriate precautions and the correct uh, personal protective equipment. It's not to say that newer chemistries, while often they are more if, uh, environmentally and friendly and, and potentially less toxic, may not be available or registered in the countries. They are normally, these products are normally also more expensive